All right, welcome back. Podcast number, Ben, what are we on? 67? 60, nope, 68. 68, maybe? Okay, uh, this this podcast, what we're going to do is, what was our last one? Our last one was... The live. The live that we did for Michigan Buck Pull. So that was kind of cool. We had a chance to go live and do a takeover on Michigan Buck Pull's page. It was in an attempt to... Um, try to help some people out with some home training, which has been kind of our focus here last couple weeks. <clears throat> gonna continue to be our focus here for a couple weeks. I've got a couple things that Ben and I are gonna be doing. Um, they're gonna be kind of spin-offs of the podcast. The podcast will be part of it. Um, you know, we took basically a, an opportunity with the Michigan Buck Pole and we were, we turned it into a podcast. It really was a live takeover of their Instagram story and their mm-hmm. Facebook Live. Um, we're going to be doing a few more things like that that we've decided we want to. I, I, one of the things that I think I want to push, and I'm going to touch on it a little bit today, is the idea of there's a lot of good resources out there. And I think um, I would like to work with and share with you some of the resources that have helped me. Um, so I still try to learn. I'm still constantly trying to learn as much as I can. Um, there's a few things that I'm in right now, um, and I'll, I'm going to share some of that. But it's ways for me to continually improve. My partner Scott, um, business partner, he he hit the nail on the head. I think he described it the best. And I talked about this. I think in another podcast was um, I was telling him some of the stuff that I was. And he is this way. So like for him, it's nothing new. For me, it's kind of, um, it's it's become something that I've been a a little more passionate about more recently in the last year or two maybe. But, and even so like in the short term with some things um, more so recently, but he said lifelong learner is what you gotta be. And he said, that's what you're doing with some of these projects that I've got going on. But um, he said, that's really what that's really what you're doing. And, and, and I just think it's very important that we all understand it and connect and, and, and try to embrace the idea of it. And I do think it's gonna, you know, I, I listen to a couple different people. I, I, I follow a couple different people. Um, one of them is Gary Vaynerchuk, and I don't know if I don't talk about him that much. Um, he, he, it's a lot of stuff that he talks about isn't necessarily directed directly connected to the dog training as much, um, more business stuff, but um, indirectly, I guess it is all connected, and, and it is. I shouldn't even say I guess it is. It totally is. But one of the things that he makes a point of that I think is real valuable, and I I remind myself of it listening to him at times is he talks about age, and he talks about like um, when some people think they hit a certain point. I just had my 40th birthday um, in February, so I was not in the quarantine birthday. I got to celebrate with human beings, but um, and I'm not a big birthday guy to begin with. I know some people are. I have family members, I have friends that are like birthday month people, birthday week people. I mean, it's a humongous deal. I've never been a big birthday person. Um, Getting old to me is not an accomplishment that I need to celebrate uh, with a lot of vigor. However, I know it's important to some people, so I'm not going to discount the idea of it. But for me personally, I just never never really got into birthdays that much. I just turned 40 um, this in February. And you know, did it affect me eh, mentally? Maybe a little bit, but I don't. Like I said, I you know I don't. I'm not going to let it get me down. Um, in fact, I I kind of embrace it, and I I kind of look at it. I, again, I think it's about perspective. I think you can you can look at things a lot of different ways. My idea going into my 40s um, is was, and it's because of people that I've been around. Um, I'll call him mentor even. Um, It's a friend of mine's dad who is also a friend of mine. And he was talking with me and my buddy about it. And he basically said, guys, you're you're into your 40s. You're going to be into your 40s. I think, and he's he's been through his 40s. You know, he's in his 60s, upper 60s. And his, his message to us was, your 40s will be your best decade. They were, they were probably my best decade. And I was surprised at that. I, I think, you know, best decade, maybe the 20s. Uh, I think 20s are a lot of fun. Um, 30s offer a little bit more stability maybe, but the 30s are kind of that buffer. You're in between your 20s and your 40s, and 40s are over the hill. And so there's all these different things that go along with 
with that and and it's all stereotypical and it's all none of it's necessarily true it's again goes back to perspective i think but what he said was is your 40s are going to be your best years and the reason is is because your focus on things will shift uh you'll find yourself more comfortable in that your family in your spirituality your faith those are all probably strengthening to the point of through your 40s they're as strong as they're going to be uh, your values change. Your 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 the reason and the purpose behind your life um, really become comes into focus. And he said, and in, in financially, you're probably in a, some of the best position you're going to be. Hopefully, anyway. But uh, you know, for him, he said it's a spot where you're not necessarily limited um, as much by certain things. And and I thought about that for a while, and I thought, man, that sounds probably pretty true i hope um i also think it depends on how you position yourself for your 40s i think it depends on how you how in your 40s how willing you are to maybe change some things i i my wife and i are are and she's not in her 40s yet so she's got a ways to go but you know dave ramsey is a person that we follow it's this financial guy but we took this class and um it has dr drastically and dramatically changed our lives for the better, positive. I would recommend it to anybody. Um, and so when, but it also changed, has changed our mindset when it comes to life as far as like, you know, I've become extremely uh, cautious and, and, and with the, at the loss of a better term, a little tight when it comes to our finances. And it's because we have these goals. We have these goals that we're trying to um, work towards uh, and, and it requires a lot of discipline. And so in order for us to achieve those goals, we're gonna ha we had to change dramatically our lifestyle. Uh, at first it seemed like a huge deal. Now it seems very normal. And it almost seems like a huge deal to go back to, or even take a step back in the direction. I listened to an episode of Dave Ramsey's podcast recently, and there was this guy who's got like, yeah, I don't know, his net worth is 1.8 million. He's 50 some years old, almost 60 years old. Um, He's lived a very, very, he, he, he followed this plan um, that Dave Ramsey advocates and, and promotes and is built or whatever. And this guy follows it and it's, he's really disciplined financially and he's, he's done very well for himself. And he's real nervous about spending, he, his number I think was like 10 grand or $15,000 to buy something. And he was real nervous to, to spend it, and he just and Ramsey basically said, "Look, you've you've done all this stuff to get into the position you are. That fifteen thousand dollars isn't going to change anything. You need to you need to celebrate it and enjoy it and be okay with the idea of it. I mean, he told him you should spend he could spend up to a hundred grand. Is what he told him. He said, buy one thing up to a hundred thousand bucks and don't feel guilty about it because you need to change your mental state." You need to change that. You need to shift. And so, you know, I'm totally off track of anything dog training right now, but that's how I'm looking at this next decade. And I'm going, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I've, I've created such a habit one way. It's going to be hard for me maybe to go back the other way. And so, you know, I, I, the reason I'm talking about this is because I am going to share some of the stuff that, um, that is helping me, this lifelong learning process. I'm gonna share some of that with you. I've had a couple people reach out and ask me, are you reading any books? What books would you recommend? Videos? Um, so so that's, some, that's a direction that Ben and I are gonna go with. And I'm actually going to be reaching out to a few friends um, and seeing if they would be willing to help us with it. So that's something to look forward to. Um, when it goes back, when it, as, as that last story I told about, you know, this decades thing and this, I said I'm struggling to you know how do I connect this to dog training I'm going off in a weird dis in a weird distant direction but I'm not in the in the fact that let's just take into consideration the the conversation about the finances you know we, I've become such a tight wad I'm not I don't want to spend my first communion money right now but I'm gonna it, it, and so I'm on, way on one end of the spectrum now I used to be every dollar I made I spent I couldn't spend it fast enough and so I used to be on the opposite end of that spectrum and now I'm going to probably look to force myself to go somewhere closer to the middle. What do I talk about in training all the time? I talk about balance. I talk about finding balance in training. One thing that we're doing with Bella is Bella, as she gets good at something, 
it, it usually takes away from something else. And so I need to, in order to change a habit with her strong and consistently and make it stick, I usually have to go to one extreme. And then I realize that extreme has taken away or created an issue with another extreme on the opposite end. And so somehow I have to figure out how to get into that middle ground again. And so, you know, one of the, one of the things, you know, that I talk about different items and subjects and things that are in my life, and it almost always connects back one way or another to dogs. And that's in real broad general terms. So you heard me make analogies with syrup making not too long ago about four three four podcasts ago we did a syrup making one there's all sorts of syrup stuff in there and discovering you know these this this world of sap and syrup but then there's also a lot of analogies and crossovers that basically i could have taken out syrup and maples and i could have plugged in labrador retrievers and it probably would have made some sense so that that is this is another example so uh, we're gonna we're gonna go into that a little bit you're gonna start out with a question, um, Facebook. Two two questions that just came in. I haven't even answered them yet. Um, they came in on Sunday and Saturday. They're they're a little bit similar, so they're puppy related. And I'm gonna talk about those quickly, and then I'm at the, to finish this off, I'm gonna share with you, uh, and I'm gonna to try to get into a little bit of a habit going forward here. I got a lot of different resources that I'm gonna to try to share with you that have helped me. Um, so they're beyond they're beyond dog bone hunter YouTube. They're beyond dog bone podcasts. They're beyond dog bone Facebook Instagrams. They're they're outside places that have influenced me heavily. So uh, I'm going to share some of that with you. So here's let's get into the question. Hello, I've I've loved the videos you are posting. I've been watching Foundation with Arrow. So must be watching that on YouTube. Yep. Um, Arrow was that Malinois Shepherd mix that we worked with um, a couple different times now. Uh, just got a he, he says I just got a blue healer pup. Male, seven weeks old, have had him a week. So you got the pup really young. If you've had, if it, the pup's seven weeks old right now and you've already had him a week, six weeks is pretty young. I always tell people seven to eight weeks is a good time to bring the pups home. We send our puppies home between seven and eight weeks. It usually depends on where the, the best date for everybody falls. Uh, we like to do them on Fridays or Saturdays if we're gonna send pups home. We don't do litters very often. We've done a few over the, over the past few years. Um, we're going to be breeding, have a breeding coming up this spring, hopefully, um, with Ellie. But um, so seven weeks old is is he's had it for a week. That first six from six weeks to seven weeks, I would have been probably real heavily focused on just settling the puppy in. Um, that's just it's a that's a lot to transplant a little dog like that. So he says we've had him a week. The first week, I have been working on crate training and letting him get used to being here. So you nailed it. This guy's name is George. Um, last couple nights, he's done well in the kennel with minimal whining. My question is, can I start the foundation work or is he still a little young? Also, do I do foundational work two to three times throughout the day, every day? Um, th and then he said, thanks. So that's a great question, George. I'm gonna respond back to you um, and let you know that we answered this on a podcast because this is just a really nice question. Um, first off, he did exactly what I would recommend, that six to seven week range, just settling the pup in. So his question is, can he start the foundational work as soon when he's that young? The answer to that is 100% yes, but it's to a degree and it's within reason and it's, and it's with realistic expectations. And so I think that the day you bring the dog home, you've already started the foundation work six to seven weeks when you brought the puppy home, you have started it. That has been crate training. That has been settling the pup in. You had to have brought the dog outside to go to the bathroom. So that's some of your housebreaking stuff. You probably have a puppy that really wants to keep up with you um, at the best it can. Six, seven weeks, they're still, you know, you gotta be careful because their eyes aren't even that good. You get too far away from them, they can't see you. But what you can do is you can get a little bit further away from them. And when I say they can't see you, they just can't see real good detail. Their eyes are, are, are not very good at that age. So they can see, but not as well. So what I like to do is that is a time where I can get puppies to start recalling to the whistle. And so I wander away from the pup. I let the pup just be a little bit distracted out in the backyard in the grass and I walk away from them and then I just stand still. And as, if you're standing still, you look stationary, you're, no, you're not moving, the puppy might think you're a tree or a post or an object that they just don't realize is you. And so when, and you can read these puppies' body language. And so I look at these puppies and they, they are a little lost 
you can tell they're a little bit startled and they're a little concerned. A lot of times you'll hear them start whining a little bit. They start peeping and making a little bit of noise. It's no different than if they were in the whelping box with, and they wanted to find their litter mates. And they're one puppy all over by itself in the corner starts making a little bit of noise. It starts whining, just squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. The puppy, another puppy will squeak and all of a sudden the puppy will hear it and start to work towards it. So. I use this natural thing that these dogs do where I would go stand in the yard 15 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet away from the puppy and stand still and then let the puppy all of a sudden go, I'm alone. And you almost can see it in their body language where they go, they get a little startled. You can see this with, you don't, they don't have to be six or seven weeks old to do this. You can do this with pups when they're a little bit older. It's just their eyes get better and it's harder to hide on them. Sometimes I hide behind a tree, but anyway, you get to the point where the puppy doesn't know where you are, they get a little nervous. And so I let them be nervous for about five seconds and then I become the hero of the day and I go, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And I make some noise or I beep, 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 beep on my whistle and the little puppy hears it and they turn and they start coming. And as soon as they do, I'm gonna get down, I'll move a little bit. So now they all of a sudden they see this object moving and they go, oh, there he is. So I, I like to get right down on the ground and receive them and have them come right to me and then let them climb up on you and pet them and praise them and love them up and tell them how good they are. And so that's foundational work. And it's just at a different point, it's just a little simpler. Uh, it's very informal uh, compared to a reverse heel, which is again, recall work. But if you look at what a reverse heel drill looks like, and you look at what this drill looks like at seven weeks in the backyard, there's a lot of similarities there. It's just, you're a little looser and a little less formal. Uh, you're not incorporating any heel work. You're not incorporating the lead. But that puppy doesn't have the capability of doing that. So yes, I think you can start. Now, does it need to be spaced out at two to three times throughout the day? I'm gonna say no to that. I'm gonna say you can if you want, but the formal training Instead of setting it aside to be two to three times a day of dog training time, I would say don't designate that as your dog training time. Instead, look at every opportunity that you're interacting with the puppy and say, this is dog training time. And now what you need to do is start to adapt this into your mindset going forward. Every chance you have to interact with the dog is dog training time. It's training time. And then all of a sudden it becomes not training, it becomes raising. Because we don't set aside time, you've heard me say this before, we don't set aside time to raise Lillian. We don't train Lillian. Although there are times where I'm training her in, in, in a lot of respects, all the time really. But I don't set aside two to three times a day for 10 to 15 minutes to train Lillian to be, and Lillian's our daughter. If you follow us on Instagram or Facebook, you've probably seen her. Um, she's 15 months old. She was born in January. She's like 15, 13, 14 months old, something like that. Gonna be 15 months, I don't Look know. At me, yeah. Ben, you should know, it's <laughs> Uncle kidding. Ben over here. Uh, Uncle Ben is her favorite person. So, um, but she really, we don't set aside time to train her. We just have, you know, she's a baby. You gotta take care of her all the time. And so, but she's learning stuff. Like she's learning sign language right now. So there's a lot of analogies with raising a kid and raising a puppy. She's, we're trying to teach her. Last night, we had a little bit of an issue. She likes to, sometimes she likes to grab the dogs. And she's got a, her old man's grip. I mean, she can really shake it. I mean, she's, she's not a dead fish when it comes to shaking hands. She's the bone crusher. So she grips. And she will go up to the pup, to the dogs, and she loves the dogs. I mean, it's her, it, besides Uncle Ben, it's her favorite thing. And she'll go over to the dogs, and she'll love them and be sweet and give them kisses, and she's learned to do that. But then she gets a hold of them, and she squeezes them. And Ellie's pretty sensitive. And so Ellie last night squealed because Lillian was kind of petting her, and she grabbed a hold of her somewhere, and I don't know if it was on her face or her ears or what. But she grabbed, and she squealed she screeched a little bit and Lillian, you know, it startled her. It scared the sh shit out of us, but we have to be very careful now. We're not, we, so now we're going, okay, we know Ellie doesn't have a bad bone in her body, but if someone comes up to her and, and attacks her, she out of self defense, she's got to do something. Well, Lillian doesn't understand that yet. So we, you know, we've been very, it's taken us a long time to get to this comfort level. Slowly and gradually we've built up this comfort level with the baby and the dogs. 
And so we had Arrow here. We talked about Arrow before. Arrow was here, and we it took we, we had her for about a month. It wasn't until the very last week that we would let Lillian walk up to Arrow because we just slowly, gradually needed to make sure that Arrow was okay with it. Lillian was okay with it. Lillian needed to understand rules too. And how do you teach a 12-month-old, 13-month-old at the time rules? She doesn't understand everything. So, you know, we're forming habits with this little baby girl right now. And like I said, we're doing a little bit of sign language. So it's through her school, like her, I call it a school. It's daycare, but it's kind of school. And so they want us doing these hand signals. Do you want more? Are you hungry? Please, thank you. So we're, she is learning that stuff. It's amazing, she's learning it. But I'm not setting aside two to three times a day to teach her sign language. We feed her in the morning, we feed her a snack, we feed her lunch, she gets a snack, she gets dinner, she gets, you know, at night she gets a little milk or bottle or whatever before she goes to bed. Those are six, seven times throughout the day that more, please, thank you, hungry, rub your little tummy, all these different language things, sign language things that she does, those are ways to actually use them, they're applicable, they're, 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 they're opportunities, they're really chances for her to learn. We could say, screw it, we're not gonna do that. Leave that for the school, the school will do that. But the school is gonna say to us, boy, she's really having a hard time catching on. Well, how come? Because the school only has the opportunity to feed her lunch, they feed her snack and they feed her lunch. Because we do breakfast, we do dinner, we do snack. So. If we take it away from the school and say, instead of the opportunity for her to have seven or eight times a day to learn this, because that's how many times we have the opportunity to, because that's how many times she gets a snack or food. Instead, we say, school, you should teach it in two times a day. Well, it's gonna be a lot harder because it's less, less repetition, it's less consistency. So that's an opportunity, these are all opportunities for her to learn stuff. Every time she goes, you know, she's not, Obviously, she's not housebroken right now, or potty trained, or whatever you want to call it. She, she poops and pees in her diaper. So, but she's not ready to be potty trained. And so, and there's science behind all this stuff. Like my wife really knows it. I don't. I'll just go with the flow. But there's going to be a point where we start saying, okay, now we got to start to work her out of. Like hell, we're work, We worked her out of this nook thing. She likes to suck. She likes to suck on that little pacifier nook thing. We had to work her out of that bottles we're getting out of bottles now she only gets a bottle when she lays down and falls asleep and it's only because she she just fusses too much so we're caving into her fussing well finally my my wife actually said to me she said no more you can't do that anymore i said you're the boss so we're going to change that and so we're slow we we as she develops we're going to develop now as you george develop this puppy it's not two to three times a day it's all day every chance that you get to interact. And once you adapt that mindset, now training doesn't take you any longer. I don't set time aside. If you ask me, how long does it take to raise that kid? No, it doesn't take any extra time. None. Because we just we just have taken it and incorporated it into everyday stuff that we're doing. So that's a great question and I think a lot of people need to hear this just so that they change. And this isn't just for people with puppies. This is for people that have older dogs too. I don't care with the age of the dog. I think the mentality and the mindset remains the same. I did not work the dogs this weekend. We had beautiful weather. I did not work our dogs. I did not make a retrieve with our dogs. Um, Bella, Spry, Ellie Taylor, none of them, none of them got retrieves this weekend. And it was on purpose. Uh, it was I had other stuff to do, and I said, you know what? We're giving them. I'm going to give them two days without a formal session. We're not going to go out. Ben's not here. We're not filming anything. We're just taking a break because I we filmed three or four times with Bella last week. Yep. I worked her the days that we didn't film her, so she went four or five days straight with formal sessions on on stuff that we've been working on. We've been working on sit to the whistle. We've been working on lining over barriers. We've been lining through covers. Um, different multiple retrieves been working her as a in a group I've been working the older dogs and she has to watch so we've been putting a lot of stuff on her plate asking her to kind of absorb this stuff and we I decided this weekend not gonna do that so what did I do I didn't just leave the dog in the kennel all weekend I, they sat on place and watched me work I worked on cutting I'm building a sauna I'm building a Finnish sauna you gotta pronounce it the right way, sauna. Not sauna, sauna. So I'm building a Finnish sauna 
and I'm using a 125 year old log cabin that I took down and I'm split, I'm cutting those logs in half. They're hand hewed logs and I, I'm gonna, because I don't have enough to do the whole thing. So I'm, I'm splitting them in half. And so this is a whole nother project that I'm on. Watch my Instagram story, you're gonna see it unfold. But it, and it's gonna be pretty cool, I think. But the thing about it is they were with me the entire time, most of the dogs, not all of them, but Bella was. Steph took the other dogs for a walk. Uh, they, wrote, they went for bike rides. They did all sorts of stuff outside. Bella primarily stayed on place. I brought her down to the shop. I, lo I used a chainsaw and I cut these logs in half. She sat just sat remote. Um, and it was for two reasons. It was great training for her. It was safety, because I don't need her sneaking up on me when I'm running a chainsaw. So it was a safety thing. Just sit down in the park. She sat in our parking lot and watched me. And so we had great opportunities for her to learn and understand. We had a bonfire Saturday night, and all the dogs came out and sat on a spot. Um, I mean, Easter Sunday, a couple of the dogs got to sit on Steph's lap on the couch. Like, that's training. Yeah as much as I hate to admit it, because then that night, last night, I told the girls, uh, Steph put the baby to bed, and, and I told the two dogs, I said, go, go lay down. And Ellie walked over to the couch and put her paw up on the couch as if she was going to climb right on the couch in front of me. And I said, absolutely not, go lay down. And she looked at me just embarrassed. But that training that we did earlier in the day stuck into her head. I always tell people that it's funny how the good habits that we want take forever to form. It takes a ton of consistency and repetition to form. The habits that aren't so desirable, it seems as though they get right in, after the first time. So like, you know, Ellie, now I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it's the only time because we've been a little bit, Ellie and Steph have been really tight lately. For some reason, Ellie is, and Steph are just like two peas in a pod. And so, I've, sent, I've, I've noticed that she's on her lap a lot. Ellie's on Steph's lap a lot. Well, she, Ellie, if Steph's not laying on the ground. She's on the love seat. She's up at the cabin on the couch, and, and I'm okay with it. You know, that, that's okay to a degree. I wouldn't let her do it with Bella, but Ellie, yeah, he probably earned it. So that few times, it hasn't happened often. She doesn't do it very often. But the few times that it's happened, all of a sudden I watch Ellie right in front of me walk over and put her paw up on it like she's just gonna slide right in. Oh. So the bad habits, the habits that I don't necessarily want, seems like one time they master them. Uh, the things that we want them to do, it's sometimes it's banging over and over and over lots of times in a row before that really, really sticks. So uh, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna hit another question here quick and then we're gonna wrap this one up. It says, from a guy named Zach. So we're gonna have two Facebook questions answered here in this podcast. And the reason I brought them in is because they're both puppy questions. So it says, sorry to bother you again. Um, now we've exchanged a few messages. He sent me a message a while back. He had a seven week old pup. It was only two weeks ago. Puppy's nine weeks old today. Here's the question. Uh, first, I'm gonna give you a background. His first question was, hey, I got a seven week old beagle puppy. Want her to be a tracking and shed dog. What do you think should be some good options for me to start doing with her early? And so my answer to him was, it's all about the foundation. I don't care what kind of dog, I don't care what you're going to do. I spend the first 10 to 12 months focused on building a solid foundation. If I don't have that, I can't do the stuff I want to do in the field. So I basically told him that. I recommended him watching some of our YouTube series, um, Live a Spry, Bella Be Good, Inside the Dog Bone Workshops. Those two, Bella Be Good and Workshops, um, are ongoing. Ben, and ben has, we have a huge library of them that we're continuing to post. So if you're following us on, on, if you're not following us on YouTube, I would, and I'd turn on notifications. I'd subscribe and turn on notifications because we, we're constantly load. Ben is, and we just talked about another series that we're gonna start loading up there too. So mm -hmm. that's a good, that's a really good resource. So I told him about that. Then I told him about the puppy foundation, puppy video, the foundation video. I told him about our shed training video. We have a game recovery tracking video. Shed, puppy, and foundation are all available digitally, so you don't even have to buy a DVD or have the DVD player. So I told him about those, and he said, okay, sounds good, thanks. Then he says, sorry to bother you again, but Maggie, nine weeks old now, and I hear you say, don't set your dog up to fail, so I wanted to seek professional advice to see if it's too early to start doing some tracking training with her. I see her use her nose a lot. She's even smelled her food and went and found it. I don't, so his question is, is it too early, nine weeks old? 
Yeah, the last one was, you know, how early can we start doing this foundation stuff? I don't think it's too early to start tapping into some of the things that the dog does naturally. What I don't think you do is say, let's work on tracking and not the foundation. Yeah, I, I, my, my answer has not changed with what needs to be spent the majority of the time focused on. That is the foundation. But can you start out with these little dogs on some training for the field? Yes, even a shed dog. I think you can make puppy retrieves. Now, it doesn't have to be a train, an antler shape. I think you wait. We just answered that, I think, in another podcast about what, um, no, it was on the Michigan Buck Bowl. Mm-hmm. How early do you start using your training antler? Well, it's when the dog is ready for it. And that might mean it needs to get a little bit bigger. It needs to be maybe a little bit more confident. Size-wise, it needs to get bigger. So at nine weeks, here's what I would do. Um, I would start out with a little hunt command. So you, you, you touched on it here at the end. You said, I, I see her use her nose for smell and smell her food. So I like doing a little drill where I'll take their kibble and I'll spread it out in a little bit taller grass. It depends on, now you're, I don't know where you're from, Zach, um, but if you've got grass, which we had grass, now we have snow. We got a couple inches of snow last night. Um, some places have gotten a foot around here. Some places got more than that. So um, just on Easter Sunday, there was a big snowstorm that came through here. So um, we didn't get hit too hard. We got a lot of rain, but we don't have grass right now. But when we do have grass, it was starting to green up even. Um, not to the point where you would mow it, but if you have grass that you could mow, I would take a lawnmower and I'd mow a circle. Now, this is in the, this is in the shed training DVD. We have a chapter on this. It's called the Hunt Command. But I'd mow a circle in the grass. I'd leave the grass a little bit taller in the middle. I'd sprinkle food in there. We actually did it with a couple puppies in the video. And then I would get the dog downwind and I'd let the dog find it in that cover. And so I'm introducing it to the Hunt Command. If you look at our last Bella Be Good, I just posted it today and the last one that I did, um, one of the th- commands or one of the drills that we did, we did it in the snow because I used tennis balls and I used snow was in the beginning of the session, we started out with a hunt command. That hunt command with the tennis balls, sent to tennis balls is an extension of what we did with kibble and food in the grass earlier in the summer with Bella. So the, I did it with Bella when I had her, she was 12, 10, 12 weeks old. You're at nine weeks old. Yeah, you certainly can do it. I just don't think you go, let's go train a tracking dog at nine weeks old because I think you're going to start building in skills that will apply towards tracking training when the time comes. And when does the time come? It all depends. Uh, there's no reason to rush things. There's no reason to avoid things. So um, I have done, if you if you watch our, our game recovery video, which is our tracking training video, and that's not available digitally. That is on an actual DVD. Um, that was a video we partnered up with Gundog Magazine on. Um, it's available on our website. But that video, I do use a pup that's probably eight or nine weeks old, and I lay a, I lay a scent trail, a drag for it. If you watch our YouTube channel, go to our YouTube channel. There's several tracking videos where we Foundation use... Foundation with Arrow. Foundation with Arrow. She wasn't quite that young, but very, it was exact same. I do the exact same scenario. I use a liver. I, I like using liver drags to start dogs out. So There's some seminars on there. That we're using. S- seminars that I did at Deerfest had little puppies there. Um, so there's a playlist called seminars mm-hmm. on our YouTube channel that you could watch. Um, just go to our YouTube channel and t- tracking dog or game recovery. Mm-hmm. You search that, you're going to find several videos. So we, I do use little puppies to introduce things, but I think the concern is that that's the fun stuff. My concern is that's the fun stuff. And once people start doing that, no one likes to go back to do the foundational stuff. And if you don't have the foundation, you can't do the good stuff. I just, I'm always, I'm always warning people, you know, it's like if I'm training, if I'm teaching a kid to be a basketball player and I give them the idea of open gym shoot around, all, all you got to do, you know, that's one thing that we could offer to a kid to help them develop some skill, some passion, some excitement about the game, give them a chance to go in and shoot a lot of baskets. But if you just, if you do that and then you say, that's all we're going to do for now. And that was a lot of fun. Just come to open gym and shoot. You're never going to become a basketball player because you're never going to develop skills like ball handling, passing, rebounding, defensive understanding of the game. Like you're never going to understand the other parts. You're just going to get to become a good shooter. And if you're just become a good shooter, but you can't do anything else, you're not going to be able to play basketball. You'll be able to hustle kids for pig at the YMCA, but that's it because you're never going to be able to, turn into an actual basketball player. The tracking dog can't just do tracking stuff. 
Well, I guess you could, but the problem with that is the amount of tracking that you're going to do with that dog is a real short window of time. The rest of the year, what are you going to do with them? You can't just put them on the shelf. You can't just park them in the garage like he's a four-wheeler. You got to have all that other stuff in order to be able to enjoy the dog. And when you actually start setting up more complicated formal drills, if you don't have the ability to do the simple stuff, you won't be able to set those drills up. So you can uh, start out at nine weeks, but I think you got to do it real limited. And I think you got to look at just you, look at it this way. You're just trying to bring out some natural inherent traits. I love the little hunt command game using kibble, and you're already kind of you're already kind of calling it out with the idea of dog likes to use his nose, smell some food, turn it into a drill, get some value out of it. Um, okay, so there's some puppy stuff. Now, those are the podcast questions. I'm going to share a couple of resources. I've had a lot of people asking me, reading-wise, video-wise, um, I'm still, uh, and we're gonna, I'm not going to tackle them all here at once. Two books I'm going to share with you. One of them is Robert Milner's. It's Retriever Training, a Back to the Basics Approach. It's probably the first book I ever read um, about, about dog training and maybe one of the first books I ever read, period. I was probably um, 20, let's see, I would have been out of college. <laughs> so I, that's the first time I ever read a book. I was out of college. But I was out of college. It was 2003, 2002, 2003. I was probably 20, I was 20, 22 years old, something like that. So it, that book is real simple. Um, I, I've had a couple different versions of it because I, I actually borrowed it to friends. I mean, it, this is such a good book. I borrowed it to people and I never got it back. And that's fine. I bought two, three copies of it. I used to have a hard copy. I don't even know if they sell hard copies anymore. But um, I've gone through a couple different copies of it. I had it here. I, ha I think I have it here. Um, it was downstairs. I was going to go grab it but because I was going to show it for the video. But it's... Um, my, the baby's sleeping, so I can't go digging through stuff downstairs. So that is a really good book. Um, it's real simple. I, I just I thought it was really well written. Um, I've trained dogs from Robert out of Robert Milner's kennel. Um, he's got a kennel down in Tennessee. Um, Duck Hills Kennels is the name of it. Um, it was a really good book. Another book that I've got, and I've got the book here. This is a much bigger version of it. Um, it's very similar. Um, and I've, I've found that this is why I wanted to talk about this is because there's a lot of stuff out there that have a lot of similarities. And then there's some things that have unique parts. And I think that's the value of researching and digging into as many and as much as you can. Um, the second book is it's, it's the Wild Rose book. It's Sporting Dog and Retriever Training. Now it's, and it's called The Wild Rose Way, Raising a Gentleman's Gun Dog from home and for home and field. That is not what I considered a light read. Um, it's not a light read at all. I don't use it as a book. I've never read it cover to cover. Um, I use it as like a dictionary. Like I go back and I dig up certain things and I refresh certain things um, in my mind. Some of it's drills based on some of the diagrams that are in there. Some of them are modifications that I've, that I've found to work a little bit better, but I use the real general concept from that book. Um, but it's, it is a really detailed, lots of stuff. The thing I, the thing I, I don't necessarily follow word for word on it. And I used to, I used to be a lot more like, you know, the, that, that Milner book, like I was a word for word guy on it. I just, I didn't, I didn't know anything else, and so I just followed it literally word for word. I read another book by Robert Milner. Um, I started it, and I think it's called How to, Train a, How to Train Your Dog to Be a Duck Dog or something like that. And I started reading that one, and it was so spelled out day by day, which is what a lot of people have asked me for. Can you write something out month by month, day by day, what we should be doing? Absolutely not. Can't do that. This book was written in that way. I started reading it, and I went, I got, I got into about three or four, I mean, a chapter or two. And I was like, I can't do it because none of this stuff was applying to my dog. Like it just was totally out of sequence. So I was turned off by that. I don't like a manual step-by-step -step. one, two, three. I just don't think it works that way. So that was a book that didn't work real well for me. Same exact author just didn't, didn't work for me. This book, there's a ton of rules, lots and lots of rules of, and I, I'm not, 
I, I don't do well with that either. So I use I use these resources, and I'm going to talk about lots of other resources as we go through this podcast, as an additional podcast, future podcasts. I'm going to start sharing more and more of this stuff that I think I recommend that I recommend. And so I use it a little bit differently. I use it more as a dictionary. That's the Wild Rose one. The thing about that one is it's called the Wild Rose Way. So I have over the years now seen. Lots of different the ways. So, so this this is a video. So I'm going to share a video with you too that I recommend. It's called the Drake's Head. It's 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 a Paul French video. Paul French videos are you go to go to YouTube. You'll see them. Great, I love them. Uh, he's, it's a collection of uh, films that were filmed over in the UK. Um, this is one called the Drake's Headway. Advanced. It's a basic retriever training and an advanced retriever training. It's John Halstead. And so I really liked these videos. I feel like they are done a long time ago. I don't know what the year is on them. I mean, they're pretty old. But the concepts are very similar to the Robert Milner book, Back to the Basics Approach. They're very similar to the Sporting Dog Retriever Training, Wild Rose Way book. There's so much. Now, they all have they all have their own little variations. They all have their own little spins. But this, the Drake's Headway, again, it's the Drake's Headway. It's the Wild Rose Way. It's the this way. It's the that way. It's the that way. I think these. it's a thing that you'll never hear. You're just never going to hear me say the dog bone way. I've had some people say that before. I don't even know. Stop that. I don't think. I'm not into that. I just think it's you have to, you should, and I have done my best and continue to figure out all the information that I can absorb and, 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 and follow along with and watch and apply. I think you got to apply it. And then you figure out what works best for you. So the way I'm doing it isn't always the best way for you. It, I mean, the way I'm doing it with one dog isn't always the best way for me to do it with another dog. So I just don't think it's as as clean as that. I don't think it's as black and white as that. I don't think you can say, I follow this way. I think you need to, I think you can say that, but I think you're smarter to say, I've watched everybody's way and created my own. That's, that's to me, the best way to go about raising dogs. So, but the video is called The Drake's Head Way. It's with John Halstead. There's an advanced and a basics retriever training. And you're going to see, you know, some of the things, now I've watched a lot of them. I mean, I've got 50 other ones that I'm going to share with you here in the next couple weeks. But the thing about them are is none of them, after that first one, the Robert Milner book, Back to the Basics Approach, rocked my world. It's because it was the first time I had ever seen anything like that. And so it really was like a real like eye opener. It was a life changer. Since then, I've seen, studied, watched, listened to, heard all these different versions of, of very similar things. And there are, like I said, there's always little twists to them, but none of them, the, the nice part about it is none of them have like changed my life, 180 my direction. They've just solidified, confirmed some of the thoughts, some of the beliefs that I've, I've personally started to develop. And so I think the more I get, the more I consume, the more lifelong learning I do, the better off I am because I just, I do think we have to open up our, our hearts and our eyes and our minds to lots of different variables and variations of stuff and just pick and choose how and when to apply what. So that's a real broad statement, but I think that that is the way you're going to maximize your relationships with the dogs, your effectiveness from a training standpoint. And really, when you think about it, when I think about it, what's the whole point of this? The whole point is for me to get the most, my, my goal is to always get the most out of the dog that I can. I, I know that I'll never get it all because I'm not good enough to get it all. The dog always can do more. And that's the beauty of it. That's why we're, it's a constant chase. As soon as you're settled as a dog trainer to, and I've met a lot of them that are settled into their dog training and they're, they don't need to get any better because they're as good as they get. If you ask them, there's lots of that. And I think when you, as soon as you get to that, 
you're dead in the water. But I, I don't think it's just dog training. I think it's just in life. But dog training especially. I'm, boy, if, if you ever hear me say anything like that, I want you to find out. I want you to point out to me. Listen to podcast number 68. Because you said you would never get like that. You can't. You can't be. And I, I, I hope and pray that that's, that's the path. You know, these next, this next the future, whether it be your, whether you're going to be turning 20, 30, or 40, 50, 60, 100, I don't care. You know, I don't even know if I circled back on the Gary V thing, but one of the things that Gary V says is, you know, he talks about people that are hitting their 40s and 50s, and there's a lot of people that say, well, they're too old to do it. And he said, wake up. You got 40 years left. If you want to be, if you want to be complacent and satisfied for the next 40 years, you're in the wrong he's not the guy for you. Like, 40's young. Imagine if you're 20. Imagine if you're 15 and listening to this right now. You've got so much opportunity ahead of you. So I'm looking at it right now and going, there's no reason for me. I, can, I, I have a lot of confidence that I can train a nice dog. Real nice. If I were to tell you I'm as good as I need to be right now, I, I'll, I'll fall very, very short when it comes to the, the potential that, that I and the dogs I'm working with have. And so you got to continue to try to get better. And the only way you will is by getting as much information as you can and then applying it and figuring out what works best for you. And that's why you're listening. I mean, that's why you're listening to a podcast. I got a couple of buddies that have podcasts too that, um, and I've done some podcasts with other people that I, I think... You know, Tony Peterson's, uh, what's his podcast, Sporting Dog, Sporting Talk. Dog Talk? So we've done a one or two with him, two, two I think, with him. Um, he's got all sorts of dog, he's, he's not a dog trainer, but he's talking to all sorts of dog trainers. I'd, watch, I'd listen to those. I listen to it. I, I, I subscribe to his podcast. I've listened to, I don't know how many he's got out there, but I've listened to quite a few of them. I've turned quite a few of them off. Uh, I, I've, and some of them I physically turned off, and some of them I just turned off in my mind. Like I listened to him and I went, yeah, it sounds good. Not going to do it or not. It doesn't fit for me. Not the right fit for me. Some of them I've listened to and I go, oh, that's kind of interesting. I mean, we're going to get into it a little bit more. I bought, I bought a video, a series of videos that cost me 250 bucks. I think I just bought it recently and I'm doing some studying on it right now. It's completely not how I train. It's completely, um, completely different. And there, I'm going to, I got I got it for a reason. And now I'm working on some stuff, and then I, I, I'm hoping to come up with some, some, something out of it, and then I want to share it with you. I think it's valuable. I think it's I think it's worthwhile. Um, but it's another little project that's going on the side right now. So that's long enough on this podcast. I told you this is gonna be a short one. Yep. Forty nine minutes later, here we are. Uh, we got a couple. We got Zach and we got George taken care of. We'll be I'll be sending you some messages, guys. Um, sharing this to you. Ben, when's this going to turn around? A couple days? A couple days, yeah. It'll be a couple days. I'll send these guys a message. T-shirt sizes they'll give me and I'll give them a t-shirt because I just appreciate you guys willing to help us out with good content. Um, thank you guys for the support. Please continue to follow us. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, subscribe if you would. Hit the subscribe button and turn the notifications on. That way you're going to get, you're going to find out when something new gets posted first. Um, we've got a couple other things that we're working on projects wise. Um, looking forward to continuing to bring you as much information as possible. Please don't hesitate to send messages or questions. I got a lot of, I, I continue to get them and, I, and it's, it's fuel uh, for my fire, but it's not even a question, but it's, hey, really appreciate this, really appreciate the podcast, really appreciate that. That, that means the world. To, to someone like us. So like our, our company is really small. And so when you, I try to share that with the guys when we get it as much as possible, like it's a, it's, it is the ultimate compliment. So I thank you guys for that. I thank you for your support. Please continue, share, do me a favor. Uh, let's try to make something positive um, out of the situations that we're all in right now. Here, we're, I'm doing my best. Ben is doing our, his best for us to get you as much information. Do me a favor, share it with someone that you think it'll help. I, I had, we, had, we do business with Amazon. Um, Amazon recently, we've had, I don't know why, but in the last week, twice, uh, people have ordered a shed training DVD from us because we actually have the actual DVDs. You can get them digitally now, but, um, and you don't have to go through Amazon. You can get them through us direct through our website. But 
we do we do still sell a DVD as well. And two pe two times they've ordered the shed DVD, and Amazon has sent them our foundation DVD. And so they message and and here's the thing. I'll give you guys a little insight. If you get an if you get something screwed up on Amazon, if you order something and they make and, and they make mistakes, I, and I'm not knocking Amazon because I use them a lot, uh, and I uh, appreciate them and and understand the importance of them, especially in times like this, today. But if you get something from Amazon and it's wrong, and you returned it to Amazon, we as the supplier to Amazon, we don't we end up getting charged for it. So. Uh, Amazon is giant that way and there's just no way to fight it. So if you ever get a, if you ever, you can do this for, not just for us, but any company, if you ever get something that's not right from Amazon, don't hesitate to reach out to the, to the supplier. So these people sent us messages, which I really appreciate. They said, and part of it was because they said, I can't get a hold of anyone on Amazon, but Hey, they said, you know, I've ordered this on Amazon. I got the wrong video. You know what I should do? I'm going to file a complaint or return it. And I said, no, don't do that because we're just going to get dinged for it. Um, we get penalized actually for their mistake. So what, what I have done is I've given them the digital version and, and it worked out better for them anyway. And so, but what, what these two times now, people ordered the shed, got the foundation and they said, well, what do you want me to do with the foundation? Should I just send it back to you? And I said, no, uh, you know, you don't, there's no reason to send it back to me. Here's what they have, they have done. And I'm glad, you know, I asked them to do it and they said, yeah, it's a great idea. Let's do that. I said, give it to someone that you know needs it. So a simple way for, for that person to help another person with information. So I'm asking you, you guys all have the opportunity to do it. Could you share with someone that you think would get value out of this podcast? You can share it with them. Send them a link to it. So you can copy the link. I think it's send it to them in a text message. Yeah. If you do me that favor, that's all I ask. Uh, I hate asking for stuff, um, but the goal for us is to help as many people as possible, and it will take a village to do that. And so you're our village. You're listening. Please do me a favor. Share it with someone that you think it might help. That's it. The short podcast went long, so deal with it. Talk with you guys later. <laughs>